world has literally moved our doorstep. And we believe that God has put us here knowing full well that we were to be here for such an opportunity as this. And that the future is grand and glorious. And those dreams that we had at first have had to be enlarged. And we believe that the future has unlimited possibilities for this church. I reap a lot of good things as pastor of Bentwood Baptist Church because of the seeds Bill Wilson Sr. planted. The prayers that he prayed were for a mission-minded church, for a church that would start other churches, for a church that would grow and reach out evangelistically to this community and literally around the world are now coming true but would not have happened if Bill Wilson and others had not prayed for people they didn't even know for a time they had not yet seen. Who would have ever believed that our church got this big, that our church was able to do so much? When that question is asked, I want you and me to be able to say, we believed. We caught hold of what God was wanting to do in this community through the missions and ministries of Brentwood Baptist Church. And we gave our time, our talent, our resources. We did everything we knew to do so that they could see Jesus. One of the things that is really exciting, uh, my heart personally, about our Brentwood campus is just seeing how we're challenging each other to prayerfully engage our um, neighbors and uh, community to have conversations and to talk about Jesus. When you begin to say, let's be intentional about sharing um, who Jesus is with our neighbors and let's uh, challenge one another to, to share the gospel. Uh, it's exciting when that is infused into our church. At the Church of Nolansville, a lot is already happening. We have a ton of life groups meeting, uh, different ages, different demographics, and uh, different parts of the community are already happening. That's so exciting to see. So when I think about the Church of Nolensville uh, and what's coming, I look forward to having uh, a place that we can go to and looking forward to a place that we can connect and reach out to more people and kind of be a light on a hill, if you will, uh, for so many people who want to come out there. To me, the Church of Woodbine represents what the world should look like. People of all races, of all languages, of all walks of life, of all ages, coming together and worshiping God underneath one roof and living and loving like a family. The Church of West Franklin wants to be a church that the city of Franklin loves. And so some of the ways we've gotten to do that is by one of our members has a special burden for the police officers in the city of Franklin, just to bless them and love on them. A lot of these families uh, are struggling to make ends meet and just have a lot of stress going on in their lives. And so we've been able to take some of our life groups once a week and provide a meal for these police officers in the morning just to bless them and love on them. Another way is through our ministry at Johnson Elementary School. Not only do we get to be a part of providing tutoring in the afternoons for them, but we've actually gotten to go in during the day and provide a meal for the teachers, administration, and faculty with no strings attached, just to love on them and say that we're a church that's here, we're staying, and we want to love on this city. What I love about the Church of Avenue South is that we do things together. When I first started coming to Avenue South, we got together in college groups. We had great conversations. We had Bible reading groups. And everything we did was together. In fact, the ministry that we do is incarnational. We do things as a church family. And in fact, Aaron has given us a fraction, one over 168, where we meet Sunday morning for one hour a week. But what are we doing the other 167? What I'm looking forward to is that as a church family, we're taking that 167 and doing things outside the church building together. When you walk in the doors of Station Hill, well, I would say that you're gonna feel like you are home, that you are with family. We were able to launch an English as a second language class, which has just been amazing to watch. We have people coming from several different um, nations and different religious backgrounds coming to our church every Sunday night to learn English, to connect with other believers, um, and to hear the gospel proclaimed. The church at Lachlan Springs feels like it's been reborn. To see those 25 people who had been there for the last several years swell to over 100 last Easter 
was just an awesome sight to behold. There is no end to the possibilities of what God is doing and can do and will do in the church at Larkin Springs. If you had been with us this past week, you would have seen a microcosm of what it is to be in the church and post everything America. Uh, we thought we understood how the week would go. We thought we understood how this morning would go. And then somebody said, snow. <laughs> it might snow. Where? Somewhere. We, we don't know. But it, it, it may snow, it, it might not snow. It may be several inches, it may not be anything. It may be snow and ice, it may be nothing but ice. We don't know. Go to the grocery store, get all the milk and bread you can carry. We just don't know how long this will last. Uh, and then uh, the weekend came, uh, we were making plans, const constantly talking back and forth, other campuses, our staff. Uh, what are we going to do? Do we, what do we have, do we cancel Sunday morning? Uh, they've already canceled school. Uh, it was raining, so they let the kids stay home. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, so what do we do? If, if we do have services, will you come? Uh, somebody said, well, you know, they've been trapped inside all week. The parents would take the kids anywhere uh, just for some kind of break. Uh, so we've been trying to do this all, all week long till we kind of, kind of found out, okay, this is where we are, and this is what will be happening. And, and today is that Sunday that we're simulcast. All the campuses are hearing the same message, and we welcome all of our campuses uh, through the, the video venue as we talk about the things that we believe God is unfolding for our church and all of our campuses is in 2018. No matter how you respond, and, and any time the church gets anxious about, well, we may be the last church in the neighborhood, we may be the last church of this generation, God reminds us that our church has faced these kind of challenges before. And God has always used these kind of challenges to bring the church back to its core mission and its core understanding of who we are as a people of God. Uh, from time to time, the church will lose its attention, will be, be distracted by other things. And God will use this kind of stress to bring us back. Remember, this is who you are. Remember, this is what I want you to do. Every time that happens, there are a couple of core things that are part of that movement. One is, the, is a return to the primacy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes uh, the church gets involved in some side angles, some side hustles, as they call them now, uh, jobs that aren't your main jobs. And we get uh, overwhelmed in trying to fix this or get involved with that. And we forget that the main reason we do everything is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and what He can do and will do in people's lives. An emphasis on transformational discipleship. Now, for most of my life, uh, the emphasis has been on informational discipleship. That is, how much trivia could you learn about Jesus and His ministry? And if you could, if you could bring out little bits of, of overlooked facts, then you were considered a true disciple. For instance, if you knew or, or could remember that the, that the wise men came to see Jesus at a house, not at the manger. So all of your nativity scenes were wrong over Christmas because the wise men came later. Jesus was a toddler. And if you could bring out those kind of overlooked facts in the Bible, then you were marked as a true disciple. Now, as I said, I've, I've been doing this most of my life. I will tell you that the people who sometimes knew the most trivia about Jesus were some of the meanest people I had ever met in my life. And it never got into how they behaved. It was informational, not transformational. And the emphasis is now on discipleship in that it becomes an alignment of our lives with the teachings and the mission of Jesus Christ. What Jesus taught is what we believe and what we do. What Jesus did is what we do. There's an alignment of our lives with His teaching and His life so that we become less like ourselves and more like Him. The last emphasis is an emphasis on prayer. When we realize that we cannot address the needs of our world or the challenges of our church through our own power and our own wisdom, we do not fight flesh and blood. 
Those three things are common when they happen in the life of a local church. When they happen in the life of God's people, things begin to change. Things begin to happen when we find those three core things again. As we have, as, as leadership and staff, look at what we believe is going to unfold in 2018, what God would have us respond to, the doors He's opening for, up for us, we begin to, as you would imagine, read a lot in the book of Acts. But instead of the church in Jerusalem, we focused a lot on the church in Antioch. Uh, for a long time, our theme verse and, uh, at Brentwood Baptist Church has been from uh, Acts 13, which is the church in Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas are there teaching. A prophet stands up and says, set aside Paul and Barnabas for a ministry and a mission I have for them. The church prays over them, and they're gone. Verse 4, chapter 1, they're called. Verse 2, they're prayed for. 3, they are sent out. 4, they're gone. So, I think that maybe nobody came to church the next time because they were afraid they were going to be the ones sent out. I mean, it's kind of blunt. God's calling you, you have to go, and they're gone. And then we want to be a church like the church in Antioch that runs members off. Uh, it's why at the Brentwood campus we believe that God put us next to an exit ramp. Because when you leave here you're supposed to go somewhere and do something that makes a difference for the Kingdom of God. One of the stories that we celebrated from the church in Antioch is in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts. Will you stand with me as we would pick up in the, in the story at verse 22. Now news about them, that is the church in Antioch, reached the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with their devoted hearts. For Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Throughout your dealing with humanity, there has been a moment, the moment after the call was issued, after the invitation was given, and the person would have that moment to respond. We, oh Father, are in such a moment, so we pray that you will find us courageous and faithful as Abraham, as Peter was, as Mary, your mother, was when you called her to go with Joseph to Bethlehem. Find us now, Lord Jesus, faithful in this moment. Faithful to you, even as you are faithful to us. And we pray this in your, in your name. Amen. I often tease the staff that if I ever write a book about church leadership, the title of the book is, is going to be called Running with the Tortoise. You know the story, right? The hare and the, and the tortoise. And uh, because every conference I go to, uh, we're introduced to the hare church. This is the newest, the fastest, the greatest, the flashiest. Uh, and they'll make a big, big splash for four or five years, and then something will happen, and they're gone. And then we'll go to another conference, and there'll be another hair church. And so we've almost given ourselves whiplash trying to catch with every trend and every new fad uh, that has come along. Most of us pastor tortoise churches. That is, we show up every Sunday and we get a little bit done. It's slow and steady, one foot after another, one Sunday after another. And the thing is, the tortoise will win a lot of races if you'll let the tortoise be a tortoise. Uh, people come up to me and say, well, man, you're the pastor of Brentwood Baptist Church. You're so creative. You're so this, you're so that. And I look at them and I say, you do know I've been there almost 27 years. So please don't tell me how fast they are. 27 years we've been doing the same thing. Before that it was Bill Wilson at 22 years. One of the things if you want to know the future of a church, if you want to know the future of a person, go back and find those dots that have defined their past. Missions being part of us should not surprise you. Starting churches should not surprise you. Why? Because that was the DNA that Bill and Creeley bought to, brought to our church. Bill and Creeley had started a church in North Carolina. And when Bill accepted the, church, the, the call to come to Brentwood, his family was really angry at him 
because they had started the church, grown the church. The church was finally of some kind of substantial size. They had a youth group, they had a children's ministry, they had a choir, and Bill left it all to come to the basement of the children's home. Because he caught hold of what God wanted to do here. And if you talk to Bill along, as I had the privilege to do, hours and hours, you would hear him talk about uh, missions. You would hear him talk about his need and his desire to start more churches. In fact, one of my last conversations with Bill, Bill, what, do you, what, what would you do over? What would you do differently? Oh, I'd start more churches. So one of the privileges I have of being pastor of Brentwood Baptist Church right now is to, is to be part of a, a church that is fulfilling the dream that I know God put in the founding pastor's heart. Uh, Bill and I used to tease each other and kind of smugly remind each other that of all the people in the world, there have been two pastors of Brentwood Baptist Church, and that was me and him. Nobody else knows what this feels like. Nobody else knows what this, is, what this means. Only me and him. We're in a fraternity of two people. That's a pretty good group. Well, at least I feel that way about being with Bill. He probably doesn't feel that way about being with me. But I feel that way about being with him. That's a pretty select group. So what are those things uh, that we can point to. And I'm just going to skim it real fast where we can see how God is obviously moving. Well, the big thing is we relocated. In June of 2002, we moved to this building. Chris and Craig, my sons, are still mad at me because they graduated high school in that year. And they wanted to move into the new building so they could be the first class to walk across this stage. They graduated in May. We moved in in June. They think that's my fault. We have started other churches and other regional campuses. Uh, Clearview is a plant of Brentwood Baptist Church. Uh, you know about our regional campuses, uh, Lachlan Springs, uh, West Franklin, uh, Avenue uh, South, uh, uh, Station Hill, uh, Nolensville, uh, Woodbine, uh, all, all of these uh, churches that Nolensville will be started later this spring. All of these campuses and all of these people that are now engaged in their communities serving God in a significant way. We have trained pastors and ministers. Uh, there are people who are continuing to serve on our staff and other staffs. Uh, there are pastors and leaders of other congregations who have been residents or interns at Brentwood Baptist Church. We've been part of their training. Uh, we, uh, we have the Deaf Training Center. Now, I want, you to, I want you to understand this. Anytime you hear the International Mission Board or the North American Mission Board talking about the deaf being one of the nine unreached people groups in the world, and you hear them talk about the renewed emphasis of sending missionaries to work with the deaf around the world and how they're training missionaries, do you know where those missionaries come to be trained to work with the deaf? Right here at the center, at the Deaf Training Center. That happens here. Uh, after a long uh, time of, of, of stops and starts and trying to get it to work and that kind of stuff, we finally have a Bible for the deaf. And you can load on your phone the Deaf Go Bible. Uh, now, can you imagine not being able to understand the nuances and the texture of Scripture because you couldn't really get the language. That was what was happening to our deaf brothers and sisters. And now we have almost a thousand Bible stories in American Sign Language that they can use in sermons, Bible study, uh, small group work. Uh, it's incredibly exciting. All of that happens right here in and around the campuses of Brentwood Baptist Church. Uh, we have uh, started Kairos, a uh, young adult ministry. Uh, we started that 15 years ago, uh, uh, ago or so. Uh, a group of single adults came to me and said, we want to do a citywide uh, church uh, uh, worship service for young adults. And I said, yes, I'll help you get that started, but I don't have time to do it. Famous last words. Uh, showed up every Tuesday for 11 years. And at another time, we'll talk about how Cairo saved my life and some things that I learned there and got to see God do that, that forever changed me. Uh, we have executed a successful transition of leadership, which is not an easy thing to do, uh, and we have done it. And Chris Brooks has come in and taken Kairos to places I knew they, could, they needed to go, and he's doing things with them I knew they needed to do. I, I didn't have the talent or the skills to get them there. Chris does. Most of the time I celebrate that, although sometimes I'm very jealous of it. 
but he's doing incredibly well. People have asked me, how, how is Kairos doing without you? And I've told you the story. You remember when you took your kid to first grade? Your heart was so full. You wanted to give your, your child something profound and meaningful. This is a big day in their lives. And you pull up in front of the school and your kid jumps out of the car and goes, bye, Dad. And they're gone. That's exactly what happened with Kairos. I said, well, it's time for me to step back. It's time for somebody new to, uh, to step up and lead you. Uh, this is Chris Brooks. Bye, Dad. And off they went. Uh, and and they're, they're doing incredibly well. And as I say, we, we're, we're handing off that ministry uh, to, to Chris Brooks, who, and it, it is his time. We have started a, uh, a relationship with Mount Zion and, uh, and, and had an, a, a successful start to that ministry last year uh, with the community outreach that our church is partnered with. Uh, addressing the issue of racial reconciliation in a very real and tangible way. Uh, it goes on and it goes on, starting more churches. Oh, we'll open Nolansville this spring. And after a vote of Harpeth Heights Baptist Church, we are now in the process of seeing how they can come on as our next regional campus. That gives us the church north, east, south, and west in the national area for forward operating bases. Now, this is Mac Hanna's uh, church where he pastored. David Hanna grew up in this church, and, uh, and now they're probably going to become part of the Brentwood Baptist Church family. The reward for good work, more work. Now, we are facing, we're doing all of this and in an incredibly challenging time. One, there is a lot of people moving into the Middle Tennessee area. A uh, hundred people a day or so are moving into the greater Nashville area. And not just Nashville, but all the surrounding counties. Uh, there is a more diverse group moving to Nashville. Um, do you know the number one group that's moving to Nashville? Relatives and friends of people who are already here. See, somebody moves to Nashville, their job brings them here, they come here for school, whatever, and then they call their friends and family back home and mama and them, come on down. <laughs> the biggest group is people of somebody that somebody told them and now they are part of the Nashville area. Because of this, we need more churches. Now I know you're rolling your eyes going, Mike, there are more churches and 7-Elevens in this place. <laughs> Last thing we need is another church. Now hear what I said. I didn't say we needed more church buildings. I said we needed more churches. And there's a difference. Not only do we need more churches, we need more different kinds of churches. You talk to uh, business people, and I talk about a niche market. Uh, that is, they will define a very small market, and they will do the things that you need to do to reach just that market. Uh, for instance, uh, you may have a business that sells clothing to uh, Harley owners, so that everything you, you manufacture, everything you sell, has hard Harley Davidson on it somewhere. Okay, there are people who do that kind of thing. You're going to do church the same kind of way. You're not going to have the big boxes anymore uh, and all come and we'll have everything for you here in one place. It's going to be very, very niche market in that we're going to be able to put you with a group of people who do church the way that you do it, who learn the way that you learn, who worship the way that you learn. When we first started Cairo, some of you would come to me and go, you know, Mike, I don't like Cairo. So I came, I hate it. Music's loud, I don't like that. And I, my, my response would be, well, don't come. We're not doing it for you. Uh, and, and if it doesn't ring your bell, then don't come. Don't come on Tuesday night, be grumpy. <laughs> Stay home. Uh, not, not everything's going to be for everybody. It's going to be more select. You're going to have more diverse churches for more people who do things differently. You're going to see think churches organized by tribes, more house churches, uh, more churches meeting in communities and neighborhoods where everybody knows each other and does life together, those kind of things. Also, because we live in a time of intense existential angst, I need to throw in big words every now and then just to remind you I went to college. <laughs> now, what am I talking about? Anxiety. 
anxiety. The number one mental health issue in America is anxiety. People are worried. Uh, they're worried about relationships. Parents are worried about children. Par uh, children are worried about parents. Uh, senior adults are worried about retirement. Will we have enough money? Will I have a meaningful life when I retire? Uh, young adults are worried about jobs and career. Will my career matter? We're worried about relationships, significance, purpose, meaning, hope. All of these things imprison our communities and our people in lives of slavery and strangulation. One of the reasons I'm so optimistic right now is our church is in a time and a place where people are asking questions only Jesus can answer. Questions of identity, questions of hope, questions of purpose. These are Jesus questions. For the last year or so, your leadership has been involved in a, a lot of conversations, a lot of work, uh, trying to come up with how we will focus our efforts in, in impacting and responding to the opportunities that God has given us. We've come up with the new mission statement. You have seen it, voted on it, you remember it. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ uh, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, let me show you. Here's what we mean by engaging the whole person. God created us mind, body, soul, and spirit, and so we meet needs in order to share the love of Jesus. In our ministry area, take the example of the mobile medical dental unit. We meet a physical need, a real physical need that matters, and as we do so, we share with them the love of Jesus. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. Engaging, beginning the conversation, not waiting to react, not waiting to uh, respond, but creating those moments where the conversation can happen. The whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what we mean by whole gospel of Jesus Christ. God's not simply concerned with our afterlife. He's concerned with our life here and now. We mean by the whole gospel is we're not just trying to get people to heaven. We're trying to get heaven to earth. The way we live this out at Kairos is when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, we see that not as the end of the journey, but the beginning of the journey, making sure that they have access to Christian community and resources, not simply to study the Bible, but to apply it to their lives so they can live freely and fully into the life God's calling them for. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere. Here's what we mean by anywhere. A little over 10 years ago, my wife and I felt the Lord calling us into cross-cultural ministry. We had every reason not to go. We had our first child on the way, new and growing careers, but we knew that we knew that we knew that God was calling. We ended up spending the better part of the next decade working with university students at a local church in Bologna, Italy. About six months ago, we felt God calling us to go again. This time it was to leave our life and ministry that had grown there in Italy and move back to the States, to the heart of East Nashville, to work with the church at Lachlan Springs. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel anywhere means diligently seeking God's direction and will for your life and being prepared to go wherever He calls, whether it's to your neighbors across the street, to a city on the other side of the country, or to the other side of the globe. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. So get that. David and Nicole were part of our church, teaching Sunday school class. God called him to the ministry, he missions. He goes to the University of Bologna, the center of postmodernist thinking in the world is the University of Bologna. He is there uh, working with people and in that process being trained so he'll be a good pastor in East Nashville. Anywhere. Anytime. Through various social media platforms, you can connect with people around the world and across the street and engage them with the whole gospel of Jesus. Every week, I have the opportunity to pray for people on our church's Facebook page. And I get to pray for moms who are worried about their children and people who are worried about their finances. These are real people with real needs. 
and we can meet them where they already are, online at any time. There are people who will never grace the doorways of a church, but will visit our church through Facebook. The internet gives us the ability to be available 24 seven to meet people where they are and have gospel conversations. Anytime doesn't just refer to Sunday mornings or when the church is open throughout the week. It means anytime, all the time. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. And what do we mean by anybody? Well, here it is. As Christians, the Bible instructs us to be ready to share the gospel with anybody. For me, that means in my daily work. I work as a vocal coach at a studio in downtown Nashville, and I get to work with students of all ages, faiths, and backgrounds. In one particular lesson with a student whom I had built a relationship with, he was having a moment of frustration, and he cried out, ah, oh, I feel like the universe hates me. And in that moment, I took the opportunity to share with him that, no, the universe doesn't hate you. The universe is indifferent to you. However, God loves you, and he sent his son to die for you. In that moment, I was ready and obedient to share the gospel with anybody. When I think about reaching anybody with the gospel, I think about the passage of scripture where Jesus invites Levi, the tax collector, to follow him, and then ends up going to eat with Levi and his friends at his home with his tax collector friends and sinners, as they're called in the scripture. These people in that culture would have been considered the crazies, really, by everyone, including the religious folk. And for me, that translates really well because I mostly work with sorority and fraternity students at Vanderbilt and Belmont. And on their campuses, they're known as the crazies, really. And the ones that often, even ministries, may not always think they really want a whole lot to do with Jesus. But I see, when I look in that passage, that Jesus not only goes to Levi and invites him to follow him, but then he goes into Levi's home, into his setting, says, I'm gonna show you how to follow me here. Jesus doesn't shy away from that setting or those people. And that's a challenge for me in thinking about working with these students because it becomes less about what setting am I in, who am I hanging out with, what is people's perception of me, and more about where's Jesus at work pursuing hearts and where does he want the gospel to take root and joining him there. And for me, that's what anybody usually looks like. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, any, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. Gosh, that sounds great, Mike. I'm going to cross stitch that and put it on my refrigerator door. How are we going to do it? Here's how we're going to do it. We're committed with God's help to seeing 10,000 disciples discipling other disciples, 10,000. Now, our membership right now is a little over 11,000 over the next five years. We want to have people engaged with Christ, doing the Scripture study, learning from each other, holding each other accountable in the best sense of that term, doing ministry together, doing mission together, and sharing the good news with Jesus Christ with anybody that opens the door for them to do so. As the Holy Spirit leads you, as the Holy Spirit gives you chance, we want 10,000 of you at that level. We want to have 500,000 gospel conversations. Now, I know you pen, oh, that's a lot. That's why we can't do that. Wait a minute. If you break it out, it's two conversations a month per member. Two conversations a month. Okay? And that happens when somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm just going through this, uh, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And you can say, yeah, you know, I went through that. Here's how Jesus got me through. Here's what I learned. That's a gospel conversation. We get confused because we think we are to convert. You're not. I'm not. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You are to witness to what you know Jesus has done in your life. You are to witness about who you know Jesus is. That's it. We want 500,000 of those conversations that will then lead to 100 healthy churches. Now, 
They're not all going to look like Brentwood Baptist Church. They're going to look like our, 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 our regional campuses. They're going to look like house churches. Uh, it's going to look very different uh, as we move into the future. And that's why this moment is so important. You're going to hear us emphasize over the next year the, the, a couple of terms. When anybody, everybody. Uh, everybody needs to be engaged. All of us have to step up. Anybody can do this. Remember, we always read the Scriptures and we say, gosh, I can never be Peter. I can never be Paul. Peter wasn't Peter before he met Jesus. Nobody was famous in the Bible until they had a significant encounter with Christ. Same with you. Same with me. It's not you, but it's the encounter with the risen Christ. Everybody can have that. We want all of you engaged. We want all of you knowing that next step. We want all of you engaged with Jesus Christ. We want all of you on mission with Christ. That is, we want all of you to understand this is who I am, this is who I'm created to be, and this is where I'm working. This is where God has called me to be. These are the people and these are the goals that I'm working toward to, to, to celebrate the kingdom in this place and in my life. All of you, everybody, it's going to take a radical stewardship. Now, I know you just grabbed your wallet, okay? Anytime I say stewardship, you think it's money. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about every aspect of your life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Christ has entrusted certain things to you. He's entrusted a career to you. You're called to maximize that for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are given relationships. You are to maximize those relationships. Your marriage, uh, your children, your friends, uh, your neighbors, all should be steward, stewarded by you as a steward of Jesus Christ. Christ. Yes, that does include your finances. What the Lord is calling us to do, what the Lord is opening us for do, do, uh, to do does require resources. And we want all of you to take that next step, whatever it is. For some of you, it will mean giving to the church for the very first time. For others of you, it will be moving toward a tithe. Uh, the 10% the as fast as you can. Others will be moving past the tithe, the generosity. Others will be moving to what we call legacy giving. But everybody has that next step. Do the same thing with your time. Some of you are going, Mike, I'm too busy. And that's because you're committed to stuff that doesn't mean anything. And one of the things you need to do over the next couple of weeks is disconnect for some obligations that don't mean anything to create some time so you can host a Bible study in your home, so you can lead a Bible study in your community, uh, so you can have the time to be friends with your neighbors, to have the gospel conversations uh, we're, we're talking about. I can't, one of the real frustrations I've had this week is I don't know how to communicate to you how urgent this motion, this moment is. I really don't. Now, I, I, when I was growing up, this is a time when the pastor would tell the story about the kid who didn't accept Christ at the revival meeting, went outside, and got run over in the parking lot. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. For some reason, there is a window of opportunity open in our culture. They're asking questions about meaning. They're asking questions about hope. They're asking questions about identity. And if you can share how Jesus answers those questions in a very real way, we'll see people come to Christ across our nation throughout Middle Tennessee. This moment is open right now, and I don't know how long this window will be open. I know it's open now for you, for me, for everybody. That means everybody has a next step. The days are over when you can look for a staff member to do this, when you can think the pastor's going to pull this off. This is an everybody moment. Everybody has a choice. Everybody's got a call. Everybody's got a next step. What's yours?